welcome to our class. Uh, I am Grandmaster Ben Feingold, and you're not. And none of you get that joke because you never heard of Chevy Chase. Well, you have. Have you heard of Chevy Chase? No. I haven't heard of him. Can you believe that? Yeah. You heard of Saturday Night Live? Yes. Mm -hmm. So one of the first guys to do the news was Chevy Chase. I'm not the first guy. Yeah, he was a comedian. But he would sound Chevy Chase and you're not. And they would do the news. That's fake news. Yeah. Sort of like CNN. Bam! And I, and I watch CNN only. So that's why it's funny. Okay, this article has multiple issues. No. Okay, so today's lecture on great players of the past is on Magnus Carlsen after he lost to Mama Jarov today. Oh, snap! No, uh, actually, it's on uh, Isaac Boleslavsky. And actually, as you all know, <laughs> there's an opening variation named after him that I play. And if I gave you a billion guesses, you wouldn't know what it was. And if I showed it to you and waited five seconds, you'd forget it. Okay, I like his variation, actually. I've played it a lot. Um, he was born in Soviet Russia. The country no longer exists, but uh, he was born in the Ukraine when the Ukraine wasn't weak. Uh, he died quite young. I think he was 57. Yeah. Um, and he was one of the top 10 players in the world, but he had a big problem. You see how it says, like, it has issues, this thing? One of his issues was he was in the Soviet Union in his prime when all the best players in the world were there, so you haven't heard of him. If it was like Smyslov and Bronstein and Botvinnik and Kares, Spassky, and I say Smyslov probably, uh, and I probably missed some world champions. Tall, you would have said, oh, I heard of him. But since he was like number 13 in the world and number 12 in the Soviet Union, you're like, who's that? Yeah, exactly. So, um, but for example, against Mikhail Tall, who you have heard of, uh, his lifetime record is three wins and two draws with no losses. So he's pretty good. Okay. Now, I like to say the truth hurts. Okay. Now we're going to show you what the truth hurts means. Okay. This is, this is the definition of the truth hurts. Okay. That's Boleslavsky. You got that? Then later, that was Boleslavsky. And finally, that's Boleslavsky. The truth hurts. Yeah, it's, it's a rough life. All right. So, yeah, we, his nickname is the Fat Elvis. All right. So that's a book. Man, even in the book, they gave him, like, a lot of chins. Like, you know, come on. Like, come on, give the guy a break. It's the selected game. Now, wait a minute. Wait, wait is, 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 is that the Ed's book? How many books on Boleslavsky are there, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> Are you guys all right over there? That's what happens when you don't in the class. They're just like, they're looking at their phone. They're like, I like your shoes more. And then they just laugh nonstop. They're terrible. And they're like, my purse is smaller. Uh, what's that? The fat elf. <laughs> what? I made up a joke and it was funny. Usually I just steal the good joke. The fat elvis. Yeah. yeah? What's, what's funny? The fat elvis. Right? This is funny. That's it? That's all. Okay. And even worse is the Fed Elvest. That's even worse. Yeah, if you get that joke, which you don't. Okay. So that's why Elvest is the king. All right. So Boleslavsky selected games edited and or translated. Wait a minute. Edited and translated. So who wrote the book? What does that mean that he translated it, but there's no author? Wait, what? Very confused. If I, if I wrote the book, I wouldn't want the editor and translator in the front. I get nothing. So maybe Boleslavsky annotated his own games. It was in Russian. So Jimmy Ems is like, let me hook you up. Okay. So there's an article on Boleslavsky written by Rufus and Dufus over here. I don't know who that is. Okay. And then he wrote about Boleslavsky's life. It's on chess.com and it's free. So that's, that's a long article for somebody you guys never heard of. Right? Yeah. See, there he is. That's him. I can prove it. Now, uh, Boleslavsky played in the famous Zurich 53 candidates turn, which you all know about. No, you? Nothing? One out of four. You do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and who won that tournament? I always ask in every lecture, nobody ever knows. It's the most famous tournament ever, most famous tournament book, and nobody knows who won it. Like, yeah, that's a great book. I don't know who won the tournament. Okay, come on. It's obvious who won the tournament. He was at my first wedding. Smyslav. There you go, Smyslav. One of my wives knew. See, there you go. She's like, oh, that was Smyslav. <laughs> yeah, Vasily Smyslav later to become world champion. Later. Man, that tournament was strong, right? That was a strong tournament. Okay, so Boleslavsky played there. Chess.com has a list of his great games. Okay, and now we'll look at his actual games. Uh, he was born in 1919 and died in 1977. Pretty young. Um, but the truth hurts, as I say. 
Okay, so these are players I've actually heard of. I think you heard of one or two of them. You all right? All right, good. Uh, so Roman Jinjahashvili, Vasily Smyslov, and Ruben Fine. Okay, and actually I'm playing bridge this week, and I played one of the best players in Great Britain named Mr. Gold, and uh, another bridge player said he should have played a chess match with Ruben Fine. It's going to be the Fine Gold match. That happened. Okay, Boleslavsky was white. Jinji was black, as we call him. And this is when Jinji was in his prime. And as you all know, later in life, Jinji moved to Israel and then moved to the U.S. and played for the U.S. team forever. He's still alive and doesn't play chess anymore. I think he makes DVDs or something. Yeah. So at least he's got that over Boleslavsky. He's alive. Okay, so Boleslavsky's white. I actually found games where Boleslavsky played E4 and D4, but not at the same time. Okay. That was uncommon back then. Normally, but the grandmasters from a long time ago, they just played E4 or D4. Now they all play both. But back then, you didn't have guys opening chess space to prepare you, so you could just play something they didn't know that. So you didn't have to play E4 and D4. Now you have to play both. Okay, D4, and we see a queen's gambit accepted. Okay. And if you learn nothing else in this class, and you won't, the word accepted in this instance starts with the letter A. So now you know something. It's not the other accepted. Okay, unless I'm wrong, then accept in that case. Okay, so knight f3. Now I have a funny story because I like stories. Okay, so when I was a kid, I played the queen's gambit with white. I always played d4, d5, c4 if, if able. And very few of my opponents took. But when they did take and made the queen's gambit accepted, I didn't want to be a pawn down because I was a little kid. So I was like, I can't be a pawn down. So I wouldn't play knight f3 because black might spend the next 12 moves defending the c pawn. You know, they would play b5 and maybe bishop a6, and I, I, can't, I can't be a pawn down. So I would always play e3. And today, I play e3 because you know, that's what I play. Okay. And here, they just transpose to what I know. They didn't try to keep the pawn. Okay. And this is, I've had white in this position many times. And this position... Black can play a6, and black can also play knight c6. I think a6 is more common. And now white has many moves, and I've played most of them. Bishop d3 I've played, and I've also played a4. And both of those moves are to thwart what, what move that black wants to play now. b5. b5. Obviously, a4 stops b5. And bishop d3, if you play b5, you're not attacking my bishop, so what, what's the point? Okay. And here he played knight c3, which is like the main move. So b5, okay, bishop b3. And now, Jinji did something I don't like. I think um, black shouldn't allow white to do what he did. But actually, this was a main line for quite a long time. He just let white do anything. He never played c4, and he didn't take on d5 either. On, on d4, I should say. So none of these moves ever happened. He, he just chilled. Nothing happened. He played queen b8. And this is something I yell at my students a lot, and they would never play queen b8. Never. They were like, where can I put my queen where my opponent can take it? Well, you can't take it on b8, so they wouldn't do that. They're like, I gotta lose my queen. Aha! Okay, then they go, ah, oh, my queen's attacked again. Okay, obviously after queen b8, white can never attack black's queen. So that's a good square. Also, it, it defends the whole diagonal. And especially e5. If you put your, if you leave your queen on d8, that can't be good. If you move your queen to c7, when this rook comes to c1, you're like, why did I do that? Now, as far as I remember, and I don't remember, pretty sure I remember, queen b6 is the normal move. And actually, the way they played the game is the same way they play now with the queen on b6. Anyway, I could click this button and see if I'm right which would waste valuable seconds, but I'll do it anyway. I think queen b6 is the main move. Yeah, there we go. See, I'm not as dumb as I look. Seemed to be, or best testing indicated, right? A queen b8 was played, but queen b6 is played a lot more often. Okay, and actually they both score pretty well. Super grandmasters play them both. And Anand, after me dissing queen c7, played queen c7. Terrible. Okay, I've never been so mad. And Anand, oh, Anand played Queen C7 in 1993. So, okay, I forgive him. Yeah. Um, and you'll notice n nobody else high rated played Queen C7. Okay. And also, he drew Larry Christensen. Hope he's ashamed. Probably is ashamed. 
Okay, somebody's got to be ashamed. All right, so this position's occurred many times. You got to get your queen off of this line. So queen b8. Okay, and now the key move in all queen's gambit accepted is when white goes crazy and plays d5. And sometimes d5 is a pawn sacrifice, obviously not here, because white has you know, everything on d5. And you want to open the center when black's king is on e8 and you've castled. Okay, and they traded everything. Got to trade everything. And I know this position with the black queen on b6. This is familiar to me. Okay, and then queen b7 attacking the rook. E4. And actually, the main point of queen b7 isn't to attack the rook. It's to defend the knight on d7. Because if we move the knight on d7, I can play rook e5 check, which I can't play now because you take it. And if I play bishop e7 in castle, you're going to lose your knight. So you can't leave your knight. So, so queen b7. Okay. E4, obviously. Bishop e7. Bishop g5. White has to keep attacking. Otherwise, black's going to be fine. And knight b6 is, I think, just a mistake. I think that's just a bad move. Well, maybe it's not a bad move. Maybe it's okay. Maybe. So after knight b6, okay, obviously if I'm streaming on the internet, which I will be doing tonight, this is the move that I would play with white. In real life, I'd be too afraid to play this move. But when I stream, what's my rule? You. Always sack. Always, always sack what? Um... The exchange. Always sacrifice the exchange. Right. I have a good chance to do that now because he attacked my rook. Yeah. Now, if I play rook e5, the most obvious move in chess history, black plays a defense that I can't look at. Don't, don't show me. What's the defense to rook e5? The class doesn't know because I don't want to play this move. Good class. What's the move you never play? F3. Well, oh, in this bad. position. No, but F6. you're right. F6, yeah. So after rook e5, F6 would fork the rook and the bishop, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so white didn't play rook e5. White sacrificed the exchange. Good job. And the problem is, okay, black, black played h6. But if black takes the rook and I take, you can't castle because, you know, this is coming. And if it's white's move, d6 is coming. So that's not good. Although, I'm guessing f6 might be playable, unless it's not. Man, it might not be. Because your king is on e8. Now, irrespective of whether this is good for white or black, this is the proper way of playing. You're punishing black for having his king on e8. He didn't castle, his rooks are in the corner, and white has all of his pieces working. Okay, Jinji was afraid of that. I wonder if the computer's afraid of that. Let me see if the computer's afraid. It says knight d5 is possible. And then it says h6 and black is fine. And then king f8, man, king f8. Work on h8 is pretty bad. Okay, so the computer says black is fine if he just takes the rook. So he played h6, bluff worked. Bishop takes e7. Well, you, you can't play queen takes e7 because of rook e5. I mean, you lose your queen. Okay, You can't play king takes e7 because that's horrible. Rook takes c5, you're down mature, your king's on e7. So h6 is probably the losing move, and probably he underestimated, after the obvious knight takes rook, what white did in this position. This seems pretty obvious to me that this is terrible for black, but I guess black thought it was okay. Man, my king's on e8, terrible. Oh. It's funny when you're taught as a beginner like, get your pieces out in castle, mm -hmm. then some GM loses, and his king's on e8 the whole game. And you're like, what? Well, he's not a beginner, so he can do that. Still loses, but he can do it. So what did he do? Rook takes. You could play rook takes, then I would play king takes bishop, and I'm up the exchange. So I have compensation. My king can go to f8, and I run away. He stopped black from castling king's side by keeping his bishop. Because the king can't go through check, right? Nobody? No. So what did he play? Bishop c5. Bishop c5. Now I'm threatening to take the knight, and your king can't castle. And so I've, I'm down the exchange for a pawn, I mean, which is like even. But your king on e8 is ridiculous. So if I was black, I would never have black here. What's wrong with him? Okay, so he tried to castle, but as you all know... The truth hurts. 
He tried to castle. Oh, but trying is the first step to failure. There you go. There's a guy who watches my streams. Yeah, trying is the first step to failure. He played 97. He's like, now I'm going to castle. Bam. You can't stop me. And then White stopped him. Damn. Played 95 with the idea of rook d7, which is annoying. So if it's White's move, rook d7 is winning. So Black played rook c8, and White said, oh boy, rook d7 is winning. Yeah, I'm the best. And then Black said, no, no, I got this. Rook c7. That's why I played rook c8. Okay, now I'm fine. We're going to trade all the pieces off. I'll be up the exchange. I'm the best. And then White said, no talking. Okay, now this is why you paid such a high fee to be in this class, especially you three. It's because of this move. Now, you, this is the kind of tactic I get on chess.com. You don't get this kind of tactic. This is kind of I get. And then if I solve it, I'm like, oh, that was hard. Yeah. I would solve it in one second because it's, it's a it's a tactic so like it's it's actually too easy for me for tactics i wouldn't even know if the move was right but i know it's the right move i know it's the move they want in a tournament game i would think forever yeah. but in a tactics i'm like oh this is the tactic they want okay fine so so now i know the move because it's a tactics puzzle this is a real game this is real life they don't tell you now you thought like russia the soviet union right this tournament was called soviet man harsh soviet that's the name of the tournament. Yeah. Hmm. I don't believe it. I think the guy didn't know they put Soviet. Yeah. We don't have time to write Union. <laughs> Soviet. So what move is a tactics kind of move that you wouldn't play in a real game? Rook D8. Rook D8, yeah. It's easy to analyze. Black has one legal move, right? Mm -hmm. And then after here, if you play King C8 and or King E8, Knight D6 check wins your queen. <clears throat> You see what I'm saying? So you play king d7, okay? And now you go queen g4 check. Black doesn't have a lot of legal moves. There's not a lot. Okay, knight f5 looks terrible. King e8 walks into the same fork that wins the queen, right? No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you play king c6 and check. And now, and now he resigned because it's mate and two and there's no legal moves. So it's easy to calculate now. So he has to take the bishop. There's no other legal move, right? Mm -hmm. Check. There's one legal move. King c4. Right. And now mate in one. Who can do it? Mate in one move. I recommend it. No? Uh, I still recommend it. Has to be 95, right? Mate. Yeah. Using all of his pieces. It's funny. We need all of this. We need all of these things to mate him. If you take one of them away, it ain't made. But you can see Black's king walked up the board, probably not a good idea. Yeah, but White sacked all his pieces to do it, right? So for a guy you never heard of, pretty good. Sacked all his pieces to be one of the top players of the Soviet Union. Then the guy left the country, he's like, dang, get out of here. Go to some easy country. Right, Karen? Yes, yeah, she agreed. Look at this final position. Checkmate. Although this was the final position, then he resigned. He's like, well, okay, I'm getting mated. Yeah. I like the way the queen stops the king from escaping. That's funny to me. Yeah. All right, it's not funny. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Then he beats Smyslav in 22 moves. What the heck? Okay. Now, I've played the Scot the Scotch. I've played the Slav before you were born, including Karen. But I've never seen this move. This is the Slav. Okay. I've had white and black in this position. And I'm like normal at the same time. Okay, and with black, I've played knight a6, e6, bishop f5, and bishop g4. And in blitz chess, I've played a5, but I was kidding. Okay. Mm. But this move I've never seen. c5. Never seen it. Okay. And I would assume that white would play d5. I assume. But he just played e4 because he wants to take his pawn back. And when the game popped up in my hours and hours of preparation for the lecture... <laughs> Okay, I was like, White beat Smyslov in 22 moves? Wow! And then when I was playing the game over, I was like, what, they traded queens on move 7? How do you win in 22 moves? Like, trade queens, boring, Smyslov, etc. Candidates tournament. Okay, so they trade queens. And I'm like, White won in 22 moves? It's the most boring position ever. Okay, so he didn't, he didn't stop knight b5. Some people might be afraid and play a6. 
but he wasn't afraid. Right? Stopping 97 check. And White just played really aggressive. He wants to go to d6. So Black didn't let him play king e7. Now normally in these symmetrical pawn structure type of positions where it's four pawns to two versus four pawns to two and the d and c files are open. Mm -hmm. I've had these positions, the, the nine on a6, that ain't no good. There's good and there's no good, that's no good. <laughs> I, I've had the no good side. Yeah, then your knight's on a6, you're like, why is my knight there? Uh, being bad. Okay, so castles, but I'm like, he won this in 10 moves? How do you win this in 10 moves? Now here, after the move e5, Black played a move that I wouldn't play because I would be too afraid. I'm like, I'm not playing this move, and I'm pretty sure this is why he lost. I'm pretty sure if I turn the engine on, this move ain't no good. I haven't turned the engine on, but this move's no good. And if my kids, who I teach, play this move, I'm like, what are you doing? Now, Smyslov has a good excuse. I wasn't born yet. I can't yell at him. Okay, Smyslov played knight h5. Knight on h5 is not good. That's a really bad square for the knight. I would definitely play something like knight e8, which not only my knight will never get captured or trapped, but it defends d6. So I'm stopping knight d6. And then later in the game, I can play knight c7 or the other knight to c7 because my knights are coordinated. Now, I guess knight g4 is a possible move. That looks also terrible to me. Let's see what the engine says. It'll say knight h5 is the best move. Okay, so for once in my life, I'm right. When I played this game over quickly, I was like, knight h5, that's terrible. Okay, now white played an excellent move that none of you would play. And that's because you believe something that isn't really true. And you all believe it. And I'm like, oh, I won't do that for this reason. I'm like, that's not a reason. All of you hate doubled pawns. There's nothing wrong with doubled pawns. Double pawns are fine, especially in the center. That's even better. So none of you would play bishop e3 because your pawns would get doubled. And I'm like, your pawns are doubled trapping black's knight on h5. So after the trade, which he didn't do, if he did trade, now white's threatening g4 winning the knight because the knight's trapped. And white just opened up the f-file for his rook. So white's also threatening knight d6 with a double attack. The f-pawn and the b-pawn. I mean, that rook is great. As Gregory Kaidenov once told me, born and raised in Lexington, he told me, peace activity is more important than pawn structure. That's a good rook. Yeah. So bishop e3 is just normal. But people don't like that double pawn, so they won't do that. Okay, Smyslav's like, I'm not letting you do that. Played Rook, F, Rook H C8. Now, I was wondering for less than a second why G4 doesn't win the knight, and then I realized this bishop's not defended very much. So, if it was Black's turn to move, this is the kind of tactic they would give you. And the answer would be bishop takes bishop, pawn takes, Rook takes, then you would say it was really easy, right? Yeah. Okay, so white played bishop e2 attacking the knight, g6 defending the knight, knight e4. Man, white's looking good over here, look at that. Okay, and, and I told you about this terrible knight, I told you. You didn't believe me, but I was right. Terrible. Okay, he took because he has to. I, you can't let me play knight takes and get rid of your dark squared bishop. You gotta get rid of my dark squared bishop. Imagine if I play bishop g5 check. Ugh, terrible. Okay. And now, unfortunately, you can't defend the d6 square. When white played e5, he was hoping to play knights to d6. But then black's like, I have a bishop here and I have a king here. You can't play knight to d6. Well, the bishop on c5 is gone. So now I don't know which knight's going to d6. Man, the truth hurts. Then this is hanging, this is hanging, this is trapped. Terrible. Rook c2 with the faux aggression. Knight d6, ignoring his bishop. For obvious reasons. If you take the bishop, I got this move. You have one legal move, you agree. And then this is a skewer with your king and rook and such. <laughs> yeah, and so forth. Okay, so knight d6 threatens this, got to stop it. Played rook f8, that stopped it. Bishop takes that knight which isn't a move that would occur to me. It's funny, this knight is actually worse than this knight. This is obviously winning for white. 
White's knights are in the center, Black's knights are on the side. You were taught not to do that. You would think a world champion would have more, you know, instinct. But he wasn't world champion yet, so it's okay. So it takes G4, Matt Larson style. Black has one move. Knight G7. Man, knight F6, the truth hurts. Knight F6 is funny because it traps this knight even more. Keep trapping the knight. Now, if it was white's move, and it's not, but if it was, and white played knight takes h7, attacking your rook, right? If you move your rook, then rook takes f7 check. So that's all, everything I said was really harsh. That was really bad, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so black said counterplay, bishop c6, I'm going to attack, rook g2 check, if only it was black's turn. And this is a fantastic move. It's the last move of the game. Okay, this is great. White wants to thwart this threat, and White says, hmm, these pieces are terrible, these pieces are great. So he got rid of the great pieces and made the threat irrelevant. Pretty good. After rook g2 check, you don't want to play king h1, but you have to play king h1. Mm -hmm. So you gotta let yourself play king f1. And you have to take all these pieces, giving you the answer. Rook F2. That doesn't attack this. Oh, okay. You only attacked one piece. Your move would win. This wins quicker. It's like Rook F2 because it attacks the Rook. Rook C1. Rook C1, yeah. Same as Rook F2, except if your Rook moves away, you're going to lose this. Now, Rook G2 lacks punch because I play King F1. And then you got this issue. This is a big issue. Because rook d7 is going to be mate, and when you get mated, you're going to lose. Let me give you an example. Let's say you attack because you're aggressive, and then your bishop's hanging. Say you move your bishop, right? That's somewhere. Then I go check, checkmate. That's a cool checkmate. No? I thought so. Yeah. Okay, well, if you don't do that, what do you do? If you move your rook away and don't check, you're going to lose your bishop. It sort of says to yourself, okay, I better trade rooks. If you trade rooks, I'm threatening your bishop. If you move it away, I have that mate I showed you. So I guess the only move is bishop here. That way you stop the mate, right? Now there's no rook d7 mate. Yeah? Man, now you wish you were in mate. Oh, horrible. Worst position ever. It's a picture in a book I have of worst position ever. Yeah. So I'm guessing, without knowing... After rook fc1, it's like plus 9, even though material is equal. Okay, and I showed this to a class in Germany, and they said it was plus what? 9. Right, correct. All right, yeah, so I was right, because I looked at it for one second, and it's plus 6. So it's going to go to 9 eventually. That's pretty bad when there's no material disparity, and the computer says that. That's, that's like you're up a rook plus tax, plus tip, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now my computer's making noise. That means black position's really bad. Can you hear it? Hear the fan? Yeah. yeah. It's funny, uh, the Jangs, or whatever you pronounce them, uh -huh. I think it was them. They were looking on their computer, and, they had the, and it was making louder noise. Yeah. I was like, what's that noise? And like, we have stockfish. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Like, it was really noisy. There's something wrong with their computer. It was like really noisy. I was like scared. It was a really bad position. Yeah. Okay, so, so Smyslav resigned. So Smyslav, you've heard of, world champion, and he got beat pretty bad that game. Haven't heard of that guy. That guy's good. Okay, last but not least, he beat Ruben Fine. Now, the reason I want to look at this game, and quickly, because you know, our thing is starting soon, is you guys don't know about this match, but I do. 1945, there was a match between Russia a.k.a. USSR, and USA played on, like, through the air somehow. I don't know. Whatever they did in 1945. They called it the radio match. Mm -hmm. They contacted each other somehow, I don't know, through radio waves? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then it was all the best players in both countries. I forgot how we did, except I didn't forget. <laughs> Man, we got beat. But you could see, like, obviously that Bovinik and so forth. And well, Boleslavsky made the team. Probably it was Bovinik and Karas, and probably there's a Wikipedia article about the match. And it says we got beat. Ruben Fine was considered top 10 in the world. 
Okay. Also, he was the favorite player of the Indigo Girls. Nobody? Nothing? Have you heard of the Indigo Girls? No? Mm -hmm. You heard of them? Mm -hmm. they're, they're like what? They're from here. They're, they're from Atlanta? Mm -hmm. Terrible. And their most famous song is? Easily their most famous song. I don't know. Closer to Find. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I that. Oh, see, now she knows the song. I yeah. was a fan, but I remember the song. Yeah. Only one in a million people gets my jokes. That's the Dennis Miller ratio. Okay. So, if you remember the last two games and you don't, say no to drugs. White played D4, right? And this game played E4. Because I didn't play anything and beat Ruben fine. Okay. And they played a real Lopez. This looks like game was played today until the next year moves. D6, the Steinitz variation. C4, that's explosive. Okay, these moves are all right. I got no complaints. Okay, it looks like chess. Okay, it doesn't look too exciting. And now C5, rawr, attack. Does black want triple pawns? No. A guy I knew in Michigan said triple pawns are three times as good. I wonder why his rating was so low. Oh, wait, no, I don't. Yeah, probably that pawn's not going to last long. Bishop e3 and so forth. Yeah. Mainly and so forth. Okay, so knight c8. Oh, what an ugly move. You! Okay, so double pawns are okay, but triple pawns are almost never okay. Yeah, I agree with a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, in fact, here's double pawns. Here, here's double pawns. Okay. Yeah, and then triple pawn, no. Yeah. Triple, triple. triple. You ever had triple pawns? Yeah. How'd you do? Horrible. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> now, there's a guy you never heard of named Asa Hoffman. If you saw Searching Bobby Fischer, the actor play him, because he, he wanted money and stuff. He's a, he's a character. And that described him really well. And when I, every time I go to New York, Asa's like, hey, and he tells me some story. So the last time I went to New York, he told me a story. He showed me how he had quadrupled pawns and how they went away during the game, and it could have happened again. Different, different, but it didn't happen. Like, I could have done this, but I didn't. And he won the game. That's why it was important to him, because he won the game and he had quadruple pawns. They don't see that too often. All right, so they played chess, because that's what they're doing. This wasn't an exciting game, but Black never had any counterplay. Black was always like, help, stop beating me. Keep beating me. And then, okay, look at Black's pawn structure. I've never been so mad. What's funny is, he loses the game because his pawn structure is banned until the end, and he resigns, because he's losing. It's like, I have pawn structure, I resign. Yeah. The worst pawn structure ever. Look at that. Black is like, white is like, ah, oh, there we go. And then black's is ridiculous. Okay, so white's just like, yeah, I'm winning. I have a great pawn structure. Yours is terrible. So nothing much happened this game except eventually black had to resign because his pawns were all terrible. C5, getting rid of one of his weak pawns. Yeah, and for some reason, Black played knight d6. If I play knight d6 in a tournament game, they take me to the doctor. That means something happened to me. I have brain damage. And then, like, see, give me some scans and stuff. But I'm not kidding. I, I can't play knight d6. Okay, so that will be the first move of the computer. Yeah, knight d6, first move. Yeah, knight d6 is horrible. It'll go away eventually because it's so horrible. A grandmaster would never play 96. Although Ruben Fine was top 10 in the world and he played 96. And the computer plays it. When the computer looks deep enough. Now the computer doesn't care here because it resigns. It's like I'm down a pawn and I have four weak pawns. So it's like everything resigns. But 96 is a king of pawning where you resign. So we don't do that. Well, we can't do that. No. Okay, the computer doesn't even take it. Yeah, now it takes it. Now it gets a red line even though it was the best move. <laughs> well, what? No, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a ridiculous move. Right? And the computer's like, oh, never mind. Now if I go back, it'll never be there ever. It'll never be there. Computer thought, had to look half a move, and uh, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't know that, but I know that, because you're kidding me? 96? You can't trade knights? If my student played 96, I'm like, you have a knight in pawn ending a pawn down, and now you just resign the king upon ending. That's what Black did. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the move I like. Every legal move wins, right, easily, as you can see, right? See those numbers? Okay, he played A3, he's like, ah. I like A3, it's just funny. So the idea is, white's going to get an outside pass pawn by playing B4. 
Okay, and even if this pawn structure was the same, we're obviously whites up a pawn. But we could like give black a pawn here, so we could cheat a little bit. It's still winning, because when this king moves, which it has to now, and then I play b4, I'll have an outside pawn, and then when your king takes my pawns, and my king takes your pawns, I win. Here I extra win, because your f5 pawn isn't defended, so I just take it. So what I mean is like, I play b4, like here's a sample variation of like what I'm talking about. Okay. And then, yeah. Now, if black had a pawn on g6, white would win because white's first. King e3, king f6, oh well. So even with the same pawn structure, white wins because the outside pawn wins. Here, it's ridiculous. It's so winning because black's a pawn down. So yeah, a3, b4 resigns, no thinking. Get rid of the pawns, make black's king go over there, etc. Mostly etc. Yeah, and mainly etc. Yeah. I mean, knight d6, what's wrong with that guy? Yeah. But anyway, the whole game, Black had the worst pawn structure ever. And then at the end, he's like, dang, worst pawn structure ever. And then he fixed it. Now it's great. Then he resigned. Yeah. yeah, you can't have all your pawns weak. And it's funny, the pawn that he lost with this horrible pawn structure was the A pawn. Yeah. So knight b5 looks incredibly terrible. Like, white can't do this now, obviously. So when he played knight b5, he can do it. So that was dumb. Yeah. But yeah, white, black just can't move here. Black just has no position. All his pawns are terrible. So Boleslavski in the first two games, the first game he checkmated his opponent. The second game he was like checkmating him in the end game. And then this game, this was the worst thing I've ever seen. It's like a simul game. Like black just had the worst pawn structure ever and was totally outclassed. Which, and the guy was top 10 in the world. So those were three famous players he beat. As I said, when the lecture started, he had a plus score against Tall, although so does the Asser, so. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Horrible, yeah. And, and so forth. And just like, I can't think of his name, so I can't make the joke. Ah, oh, just like Hozier, Tall was born sick. All right, thanks for watching the Boleslavski lecture. It's now approximately 6.15. I'll get coffee first. And then we can have free time. Hooray for Ben, right? You agree? All right, and as Gene Wilder always says, Class is dismissed. There we go. There's a guy who knows my lecture. Dang, I should know that one.